Since people are coming in and settling in, I will welcome everyone to tonight's History Cafe here at History Cambridge, our Indigenous Voices History Cafe. Uh, my name is Marika. I am a white woman in my 40s. I have dark hair and glasses. I'm wearing a floral shirt, a blue sweater, and I'm sitting in front of a bookcase. I am the Executive Director of History Cambridge, and I'm so pleased tonight to be here with you all in conversation about the Indigenous history of the place that we call Cambridge. So as folks are coming in and settling, I'd like to acknowledge that the area that we, History Cambridge, focus on, live on, and work on, the place we now call Cambridge, has been the traditional ancestral homeland of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge that Indigenous people still live here and thrive here, and that it remains sacred to the Massachusetts and their close neighbors and relatives, the Nipmuc and Wampanoag people. Of course, this is what we'll be talking about today, tonight, learn more about that. So as I invite you to say hello in the chat, as we settle in and share what you know about the indigenous history of the land that you are on, that you occupy, and if you don't know, well, there's an app for that. So um, Ed Bradley, our vice president of History Cambridge, is just gonna drop some links and um, check that out. So while we're all settling in, if you want to say anything else in the chat, uh, any information you wanna share, what you hope to learn about tonight, the neighborhood you're at right now, et cetera, please do. All right. So I'd like to expend, extend a special thank you and welcome to the Friends of History Cambridge who have made tonight possible. If you want to consider joining our group, we're a really fun group, head over to our website, historycambridge.org, and click on the support button at the top of the page. Tonight's program and our larger Indigenous Voices project is funded in part by the Cambridge Community Foundation, and we thank them for their support for this project. Now. If you don't know, History Cambridge is a private nonprofit with 1.88 employees. Like, how does that work out to actual people? Well, I'm one full-time and we have two part-time staff. We do so much. It's incredible what we can get done. Events like these with a small amount of money. So we rely heavily on donations from the public. And if you like what we do and you want it to continue because you can't get it anywhere else, um, please consider making a gift. Uh, but another way that you can help us is by coming to our events and telling your friends how great they are. Follow us on social media, sign up to get our e-news, and you don't want to miss out on great events like this coming up. So sign up and follow us and see what we're all about. So last bit of housekeeping is that tomorrow you'll be receiving a survey in your inbox asking you how you liked this program. I'm assuming you're going to love it. Please fill it out. It's important to us to know um, what we're doing well and how could we be better. We appreciate your feedback. So I'm so pleased to be joined tonight by our Indigenous scholars and friends, Sage Carbone and Dr. David Shane Lowry, who I will formally introduce to you now. Sage Carbone is a member of the Northern Narragansett tribe of Rhode Island. She grew up in New England and now lives in East Cambridge. She has degrees from Wheelock College and Simmons University and is a co-founder of Cambridge City Growers, a neighborhood organization that rematriates underutilized spaces to grow food. In addition to many other projects, she does many projects here in Cambridge, she's working with the city of Cambridge on an indigenous signage project made possible by the city's participatory budgeting initiative. She'll be hopefully telling us a little bit more about that. Welcome, Sage. And Dr. David Shane Lowry is an anthropologist and citizen of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. He's currently a senior fellow in the School of Social Policy at Brandeis University. And in the academic year 2021-2022, he was a distinguished fellow in Native American Studies at MIT. He's beginning a book with MIT Press titled Indigenous MIT, The Origins of Science and Technology in American Genocide. David is a graduate of MIT and UNC Chapel Hill, and he lives in Cambridge. So I hope you'll all welcome with me uh, Sage and David. So before we dive in, I uh, just want to set the stage a bit and share some background on us as an organization and how we came to work uh, on this partnership with Sage and David. So History Cambridge was an organization founded in 1905 as the Cambridge Historical Society, uh, exclusive by design, and we collected histories of Cambridge, which meant that um, we didn't collect all the history of Cambridge. We were collecting some of the stories. Uh, 
Uh, today, as History Cambridge, we are sort of a 180 from that. We're committed to working with everyone to fill in gaps in the historical record. To that end, we, like many people of Cambridge in this area, are very curious about the place we now call Cambridge. And uh, what was it like before colonization? And because we are a white privileged organization, uh, we knew we needed to have some help to tell this story. So we were lucky enough to get a, a small grant from the Cambridge Community Foundation and to work with uh, Sage and David on this project. Now, this is a long-term project. Uh, trying to learn the history of something that is so significant in the history of time is going to take a long time. Um, we literally just started this project this year, and it's going to take us many years to work on it. And it's not a one and done with us with History Cambridge. We are going to keep learning about it, um, working with folks, and trying to get to the bottom of it and sharing it all. We are not alone in doing this work in Cambridge, thankfully. There are a lot of folks doing history. We are friends with all of them, and we want to continue that. And it's so important to have many people working on history because there's so much to be done. The time is really important in our minds because we have two big anniversaries coming up. We have America 250, which we'll be celebrating 1776 um, in the year 2026. And a few, a few years after that, in 2030, we will be celebrating Cambridge 400. In our minds, this is the perfect opportunity to think about this history, and what we've left out of the story as we start to celebrate, celebrate, commemorate these anniversaries. So tonight uh, is sort of like the end of phase one of our project uh, with Sage and David, but it's it's phase one of question mark. There are many ahead of us, um, so I don't want to imply that anything is done here. Um, and as part of phase one and going into phase two, it's important for us as an organization and Sage and David particularly wanted to know from Cambridge what you want to know and what's missing. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we have... You're welcome to ask questions in the chat and make comments in the chat, please do. And uh, if you want to ask a question anonymously, we have a Google Doc um, that's been put in the chat. You can put your questions in there and um, feel free to ask anything. We may not even get to it all tonight. There's almost too much to talk about tonight, but uh, rest assured we will be holding it all, learning it all and reporting back to you at another time. And um, there's another piece of information, this is like my last point. Um, we, did, we did a survey that asked, how were you taught indigenous history? And we had a lot of folks respond and it was very helpful and interesting. I'm gonna share some results in a little bit, um, but if you haven't done it, we'll put the link in the chat. Please fill it out at any time. It's an open-ended survey. So we're gonna start out tonight with some questions for Sage and David. We're gonna have a conversation. Sage is gonna share some imagery from the research that she has conducted. And we're gonna have, ask you some questions, you're gonna ask us some questions, and we're gonna see what we can get done. Phase one of this project. So, whew, thank you for indulging me in all of that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Sage and David, give you the floor, and I'm gonna start off by asking, why did you agree to work on this project with us? Mm. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate um, you all having me today. This is Sage Carbone talking. I am a light-skinned indigenous woman in her early mid thirties uh, with dark eyes, dark hair and a lopsided bun today. And I started, um, you know, I became interested in the indigenous people's history hub because I saw that there was an article written by History Cambridge in the Cambridge Day. And so I decided to reach out and ask History Cambridge whether they had any uh, indigenous folks that were advising them or involved in their projects. Because honestly, I saw that it was really good work that wasn't being done by some of the other organizations in Cambridge. So I reached out and that was probably what, six, seven months ago so far. And uh, I've really enjoyed learning more about History Cambridge and you know having some fantastic conversations and articles written uh, 
in the meantime. So. Thanks, Sage. David. Hey, y'all. Um, so the question was how, why am I interested? Why, why did I become interested in our work? Was that the general gist of the question? Um, I actually just look at the Cambridge Day article. I don't know if I chose that title. If I did, I made a mistake in a way. Um, Cambridge doesn't have an indigenous problem. It has a colonial problem. Uh, indigenous people are never the problem. So, um, and I, I take that really, I, <laughs> well, I take this so seriously, that kind of shift of words or shift of terms is because there was a book written by a white anthropologist called Darren Blue about my tribal community, the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, years and decades ago. Uh, and it was called The Lumbee Problem. And what the people in my community always thought was, why is a book titled The Lumbee Problem? Why are we a problem? When, in fact, she didn't really mean that. And that wasn't what she was insinuating. But anytime you put Native, Indigenous, whatever the term is to identify us, and the word problem together, we have to be not just careful with that. We probably don't want to say it. Uh, <laughs> so if I chose that title for the article, I apologize. But with that being said, um, I think it invites us into a conversation about why I'm here and why Sage and I have partnered with you all here on History Cambridge. Because quite honestly, it um, not only is colonialism a difficult conversation, it is packed underneath layers and layers of uh, secrecy, of miseducation, um, of political sort of um, disregard, um, of distraction politically and economically and everything of that sort, all kinds of distractions, to the point where when people very honestly in their own selves say, I want to know more about this history, this contemporary playing out also, not just history, contemporary playing out of colonialism, how have Native people been displaced and, you know, disremembered and, and killed and murdered and stolen? Um, it's a conversation about getting people to understand these layers within which we must kind of dig ourselves out of to then bring Native people, Indigenous people, American Indian people to the fore, to the front, right, of the conversation or to the center of the conversation, and then continue on from there. So um, I'm a trained anthropologist. Um, so Sage will tell you, oftentimes I may not talk consistently about in a conversation, like in a meeting or whatever, I'm more so the one that's looking for angles that we can approach that help make our conversation go uh, a bit more efficiently <laughs> to kind of expedite and push forward what I think is a process of decolonization um, to include land back and things like that, um, that many Native Indigenous people are asking for, not just in the United States, but across the world. So anyway, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to have both of you. And I'm wondering if, Sage, we can just start by, um, if you could just sort of, I know people are just like hungry for some facts about Indigenous people in Cambridge. Can you share some? Who was here? What tribes? Like, uh, there's a question in the chat, what Indigenous languages are native to Cambridge? Like, can you just um, give us a little bit of that history? Sure, absolutely. So uh, the language sets that we know of that is around Cambridge and Massachusetts is considered Southern New England Algonquin dialect. And Algonquin is a group of words that are all along the Eastern seaboard. Um, many of them even extend correct me if I'm wrong, they're probably pretty close to the Lumbee tribe. And um, this would have different dialects that are very similar with um, Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Wampanoag, Narragansett, Pequot, um, Mashantucket. So there are different um, and when you look at how languages are um, either separated out or pronounced, it is generally distinguished between North and South of New England. So um, Massachusetts right kind of in the middle, um, but because Maine was actually a part of Massachusetts when many of these uh, translations were written, you know, it's kind of considered in, in that portion of it. Uh, there are a couple primary source documents that we uh, draw from to create or 
find the words that um, were lost throughout, you know, written history and that were lost from um, oral tradition. So a, a primary one of that is um, the Natick language um, was translated in what's called the Eliot Bible. And so we have quite a few um, direct translations from there, along with um, reports of what were called the praying Indians and what are still called, um, it's still a, a, an organization out in Natick of uh, Christianized indigenous folks that, um, you know, whose language was used and, and is actually, it's one of the few that has been preserved. So that's um, one of the kind of the pluses and minus of colonization is, is that preservation through um, religious documentation. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll add to that. That's a great uh, beginning stage. Um, uh, yeah, Algonquian languages were spoken uh, and continue to be spoken here in New England all the way down into the South. Uh, what a lot of people tend to do in American ethno history um, is see language as being bounded in certain places. So they'll say, well, Algonquian languages must have existed in this portion of the United States. What that tends to do is kind of help negate the way that Native Indigenous people in Americas moved around. Um, so you had people in North Carolina that were traveling to uh, Illinois 10,000 years ago uh, to what is now California. Um, and this is an important point I think to state here, I'm an anthropologist, so I speak a lot to archaeologists. There's emerging storylines of archaeology that debunk the myth of, of people being in America just like 14,000 years ago or 20, and actually say that we're, we've been here 130,000 years. Uh, that's not only a new reframing of world history, of American history, it's a reframing of world history. Um, and it states basically the fact that when Native people say we've been here time immemorial, we've been here time immemorial period uh there's no more recent history where we crossed a you know strait of land or crossed even an ocean like a couple ten thousand years ago no we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years ago uh when our ancestors were here in america so i just want to set that kind of out out there with that being said back to the languages um there was a fundamentally complicated economy of native indigenous movement in America, uh, which inter interfaced with agriculture, with inter which interfaced with an economy of transportation um, that again, uh, has to be more recently has been spelled out a bit more by ethno historians and even archeologists who say, wait a minute, um, we just don't really understand and really fully appreciate how native people as full human beings with language and tradition, and desires to, you know, do certain things that every human wants to do, uh, were fundamentally across and within different communities across the United States in, in ways that we really don't fully understand. Uh, we, we haven't been as Native and non-Native people allowed to tell these very complicated stories. With that being said, um, to kind of set the tone, I just put in the chat um, a link to a book called Firsting and Lasting by, I think her name is Jean O'Brien. She's a historian at University of Minnesota. Uh, she writes a lot about New England. And if you want a good basic text to begin to kind of unravel uh, sort of how, not just give you a story of how Native people have existed in New England, but how we, how Native people have been disappeared through decades of American history. So we're talking from 1600, 1550 on. Um, that's a great text to, to utilize. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I'm going to switch now and show, um, I mentioned we did this survey. And uh, I'm just going to share some of the results that we had, because I thought they were kind of interesting. A little food for thought. Um, Bear with me here. Do, 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 do. Um, so we only asked a few questions, pretty some basic questions. But um, one first question: How well do you how well do you know the Indigenous American Indian history of Cambridge? And I put the scale here. It was one not very well, five very well. You can see that um, people think they don't know it. So uh, that's 
interesting information. Uh, the next question was, tell us how you learned about Indigenous American Indian history as a child. And I thought that a lot of the responses sort of fell into these categories. Um, here, th this first one is uh, mostly in the framing of other slash enemy, with the exception of a single instance where a Native person came to my school, set up a teepee in the playground, and had us all come in and listen to her life, listen to her talk about Native life. In retrospect, much of what she said in the teepee itself seemed a bit out of line with local Indigenous life. So you, you hear about people did have an experience, um, you know, with, with a Native person, um, but that also didn't feel quite authentic. Um, another person said, I was not taught Indigenous history of Cambridge, but rather researched it myself from very scarce sources at the time. A lot of people mentioned that they didn't learn it. They had to learn it. Them, they had to teach themselves. And then some other folks, primarily via television, and the things that stand out more than any classroom lesson, though, were movies like Dances with Wolves and Last of the Mohicans. So you see popular culture as an influence on um, how people learned. And then the next question was, how has your understanding of Indigenous slash American Indian history changed over time? And I, I, some interesting responses here. Um, here's one. The most important part for me is learning to think of Native groups as separate from each other and not a monolithic group. Um, and here on is completely changed based on reading things like a people's history of the United States, indigenous people's history, et cetera. Um, this one is interesting. You can also see like different uh, generations of answers, people of ge different generations and how they answer the question differently. Um, some people were clearly just not taught and had to teach themselves. And then other folks, um, so we had did have some younger folks. So in my sophomore year of high school, I took a required history class where we learned more about true indigenous history and the horrors of it. Also, after Columbus Day became Indigenous Peoples Day in Cambridge, we learned a bit more about why the name had changed and the history behind it. So you see that um, there seemed to be start to be a change in the public schools, which is interesting. And last, um, I'm more interested in making up for my lack of knowledge in this area and more fascinated on the subject generally. So I think that our um, survey, you know, self-selected people who were interested in this topic, uh, but interesting answers anyway. Um, and we had a final question, is there anything else you'd like to share? And so um, some people said some nice things. Keep up this good work. If I can begin to shed my inherited ignorance, anyone can. I think this project is desperately needed. And then someone um, wrote this beautiful uh, question about living near the shore of an impounded river. I've wandered the former shoreline, imagining the twice daily tidal inhale and exhale of the river, washing over this estuary, this estuary shoulder of life-giving mud and abundant salt grasses. Sage, maybe that's a, a good place for you to help uh, describe what Cambridge might have been like, what this area might have been like when Native people lived here, and how this how the space was used, how these lands were used over the course of a year. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so, for millennia, uh, Cambridge was known as Anmokagan. Uh, before it was Newtown, it was in Mokigan, uh, which roughly translated to the place for curing fish, which makes a lot of sense when you think about the geography of Cambridge, with one side of it being Alewife, and you kind of wonder why it's still called Alewife when Alewife was a saltwater fish and uh, the area of Jerry's Pond and Fresh Pond isn't really next to the ocean. So that's one of your first indicators of the changing landscape uh, that colonization, industrialization, and gentrification have all led to in the city of Cambridge. For the Charles River side, which uh, was known as the Quinnebequin, um, which meant calm, long waters, um, roughly translated. And uh, to give a little bit of perspective on there, Putnam Avenue used to be uh, Wigwam Neck which had been on the shores of the Quinnebequin. And Fayette Square, that, which is that little green area kind of in front of 
the fire station and um, the Middle East in Central Square. So that had been a oyster market. And so you can also kind of see from there how far that the mouth would have extended through Cambridge Port and up to Central Square for easy sales. And I think even a lot of people on this call have seen the tremendous change in the neighborhoods, filling in the stations, uh, even over the past few decades. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat. What language are your translations from? So those would be from the Massachusetts and Natick translations. So if people have specific questions about any anything, put them in the chat, put them in the Google Doc um, and let us know. I'm going to keep, so just those will come in whenever. I'm going to just ask some um, provocative questions. So uh, both say, I'm going to, I'm going to start with, with, I'm going to start with Sage because you already have the floor. What does it mean to you to be indigenous in Cambridge? Oh, geez. Well, I learned recently by reading some of the um, census numbers that there's 600 of us. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it means we are underrepresented in city government, in the housing programs, in employment numbers. And for me personally, I am on a mission to repurpose some of the underutilized spaces, both through my gardening group and for my own needs as, you know, as a young person that's just trying to find a place, you know, to grow. Um, I think that I've faced some criticism in bringing up the inequities with funding diversity programs in the city and specifically some of the um, DEI training exercises that are given um, to city employees as, as a former employee. So um, what I would like to see as an indigenous person to feel you know, really more secure here is just a little bit more, um, when we talk about BIPOC organizations, there needs to be indigenous folks represented in there. Mm -hmm. When there are programs about indigenous history, they should not be combined with black history or immigrant history or anything else, because I think it, it really um, works to our disadvantage, the disadvantage of the people learning it and of each of those individual groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gwen, I see your hand up. I'm going to get to you in a second. David, can I uh, toss that over to you? What, is, what does it mean to you to be Indigenous in Cambridge? Whoa, that's a loaded, that's a loaded question. Um, because uh, I came to MIT in 1999, um, I came at a time when it was still legal for Native people per, per law to go between Cambridge and Boston. Uh, Mayor Menino actually worked with a coalition of mostly non-Indigenous people, if I'm not mistaken, in like 2004 or five, to uh, 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 remove the law, which was I think called the In Indian Enslavement Law or Imprisonment Law, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that that made it illegal for people like me to to pass between Cambridge and Boston. So, I knew about this as a young Native student in '99 and 2000. I I heard people talk about it. I heard from people who Wampanoag who also attended MIT at the time um, that that was a thing, and they knew about it. And they quite, kind of said, "Well, technically, in my everyday life, it doesn't affect me, but it's still a law. It's still there, right?" So as you move forward in history, I noticed some things like. Um, here, I'll share a link with you. You can look at it later. 
uh, MIT has a um, what they call MIT hinge. So basically, there's a three three football field long hallway at MIT where several times a year the sun shines down the hallway and it's like a perfect alignment and they call it MIT hinge. Well, as a native person from the South, I kind of, you know, I just have my indigenous spidey senses, if you will, I always go up when certain conversations are happening. I'm like, wait a minute, if this was happening now in this hallway, that it had to be happening, you know, 10, 15, 50,000 years ago, right? And uh, we had an elder, and I think they were Wampanoag, if I'm not mistaken, I could be mistaken, uh, but they actually were speaking to some of us MIT students who were native years and years ago, maybe 20 years ago. And they were telling us, um, you know, this is something that the orchestrators of MIT, when they, you know, they had our stolen land and they knew about these uh, solar traditions, these solar relationships, and they built the infinite corridor, which is the name of the hallway at MIT on purpose because they understood from our stories what the sun did in that particular place in Cambridge. Um, so for me, I always, you know, from the very beginning in 1999 and onward, I always felt like MIT and Cambridge more generally was built upon uh, the purposeful abuse of and disappearance of Native people in Cambridge and Boston and, and Massachusetts and New England more generally. Um, am I jaded because of that now? Of course, I came up in that time, but I'm jaded within the context of we're here now attempting to address and reverse uh, the conditions within which I wasn't able to talk freely and other Native people weren't able to talk freely about how Cambridge and is, is an explicit hijacking of indigenous relationships to land, water, solar, right, to the sun, um, and, and to the universe more generally, so. It's interesting to think about this, um, uh, you know, erasure of indigenous people. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I pose a question to the audience, if you can come up with a way that, can, can you give an example of how Indigenous people are represented right now in Cambridge? Can, can we think of any? I mean, the word Massachusetts, the name of our state, I guess. Is there any, I'm, I'm, there's some some stuff at Harvard, some physical, there's a physical monument, but what? It's interesting. And and then I, I know Sage is obviously working hard with the particip participatory budgeting folks to get some signage up. But um, I'm going to, Gwen, you have a question. Um, well, I, I was, I, I have an answer of one image of an Indigenous person that I found um, in the stormwater wetland. Um, in It's a DCR image. It's, um, but I, I, I don't know how whatever exactly how to feel about it because it's uh, what I've shared it with Sage um it's um it's an image that's on a kiosk like a, a three-sided sign if people know where the stormwater wetland is um behind the LYFT station there's this beautiful park with boardwalks and there are birds and the path that goes from Cambridge to Belmont and they have very little signage. They have a kiosk that has a history with a teeny bit of indigenous mention of indigenous people. Um, and then there are these rocks with pictures of uh, an animal, a plant, like um, silver maple, the American woodcock, a frog, and it has it in English and in Latin. <laughs> so the obvious thing that's missing is the indigenous language. But there's also a picture on the sign of a of an in, a rock w marker, a stone marker with an indigenous person on it. But I've never seen the stone, so I don't know if DCR decided or somebody told them don't do that. Don't put a picture of an indigenous person and then um, just animals and plants and don't provide any context or history. At any rate, my question was just that I wanted to hear more about about Sage and um, David's project and what your hopes and intentions are for the participatory budgeting funding. And I'm sorry for so many words. Sage, you want to tackle that? 
I love it. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to send you um, the indigenous, uh, the na it's called Native Place Names of New England book, and it has, uh, I think it was made, it was written in the 60s, the early 1960s. Um, and it has place names, general translations, and also some of the like basic animals, numbers, weather, things like that, that we're actually going to be utilizing to create some of the um, participatory budgeting projects. Um, and it, the project is ongoing with the Historical Commission. And I like that you pointed out, Gwen, that the one sign you saw was from DCR, which is not Cambridge. That is, you know, that is a mass state entity. Um, and so it really, what we're doing with this city kind of breaks down into uh, a couple of different areas. The first is to um, revise current historical markers. So those are the ones that have um, paragraphs and paragraphs of history of Cambridge, some of which um, the one near me uh, on Cambridge at Third Street refers to the row of homes built in East Cambridge. Their purpose was to keep out roving wolves and Indians. And that is the only mention of indigenous folks on that entire marker. Uh, so some of it is revising some of the, those those large um, those large narratives. The others are um, direct translations, things that uh, would kind of normalize seeing indigenous words and presence in our everyday lives. So I live on Third Street, so there would be the translation from 1st through 6th Street minus 4th, because that's Sharapa, um, for all of those different numbers. So that appeals to um, younger folks. So the, uh, really the purpose is a little bit of everything. Um, for those that want to sit and learn a little bit more context um, in a park, uh, that would be Winthrop Square is one of the major markers that Elizabeth Solomon is working on. She's in a uh, scholar and a Massachusetts elder, though she might be mad at me for calling her an elder now. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll erase that part of the recording, just kidding. And, um, you know, and then just some of the basic stuff that, that people had talked about in their survey responses. So how did you learn about it? How did you see it that it was in as, uh, as you were learning about it? And easy to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll follow up on Sage's, uh, what I think has been a brilliant uh, uh, blueprint, if you will, if I could use that term, for doing this work in Cambridge. I mean, Sage was doing this well before we met, um, and we just teamed up and kind of had brainstorming sessions together. Um, but a, a theme that has consist, consistently come up in my conversations with Sage and other people is the fact that Cambridge and Boston can't be separated, that if anything, the MBTA connects, the public transit system connects uh, Cambridge and Boston in, in very intimate ways. So if you go to Park Street, for example, there's a big mural on Park Street that shows you like the beginning of like how Park Street and MBTA sort, sort of started at Park Street. And then if you read the lettering on there, there's uh, terms, you know, some language about how at the beginning of digging up Park Street, they found, uh, I think the, the official language used is Native American objects. And that's basically all it says. And it's sort of blah, blah, blah. And here's Park Street. And that was the beginning. And uh, my question to the city archaeologist in, in Boston was, number one, what happened to all those objects which somebody's narrating? You know, they were dug up. They were obviously in the middle of this earth that was disrupted um, for public trans transit. So I, I'd say all of that, that's an ongoing conversation. I say all that because whereas I think a lot of people, again, to my earlier point, want to localize these histories, localize Native people into a place. What were Native people here in Cambridge like? We do want to generally talk about that, but it's within the context of this much larger conversation, which uh, we Native across tribal lines, across tribal national lines are having. Uh, this conversation about how we have always been mobile and how 
the histories and the contemporary nature of our suffering is is very much attached uh, attachments of Cambridge to Boston and to other larger regions and, and nations. So um, I just want to kind of put that out there because I, I don't want anybody here in this moment or kind of looking forward to become siloed and to think that um, the conversation has to be attached to this piece of property. Yes, we need to understand what is happening in Cambridge, but always keeping in mind how it's intimately attached to these uh, the progress, if you will, if you want to use the term progress, even though it's not progress, the progress of settler colonialism um, in the United States. Thank you. This We have a clarifying question. Uh, could you speak to the difference between using the words native and indigenous and, of course, American Indian? Can you just shed a little light on all of that? Yeah. Um, That's you, David. Yeah, in many ways, this is an ongoing conversation. And I'm actually in the middle of writing a piece for this journal called Anthropology Now. Uh, which will describe in more detail what the stakes are in, in using proper language. Um, I, I to to contextualize where we're at in the in the in the in the labeling of native people, and I just use the term native. Um, there's an organization based in Cambridge called uh, Cultural Survival, I believe. And I remember when I was a student at MIT, again twenty plus years ago, uh, they were focused on indigenous people, but in other countries. We didn't use the term indigenous to describe ourselves in the United States. And in fact, when students who were indigenous to Hawaii would come to the United States and go to institutions like MIT, they would look at native people in the United States to say, we're not the same. We're indigenous people from Hawaii. You all call yourselves Native American or American Indian. So again, as with all colonial realities, there's these layers, right? Uh, the beginning of the United States, the Declaration of Independence calls us merciless Indian savages. From that moment forward, there was an official document in the kind of um, uh, atmosphere of American life that situated us as Indians or American Indians. Um, now, fast forward 100, 200 years, and that dehumanization of us in the Declaration of Independence, now we Native people have an organization called the National Congress of American Indians. What's been an interesting kind of note, if you remember Jesse Jackson, there was this whole kind of thing with him back in the day calling African-Americans black or black African-Americans, I forget which way it went. With Native people, it's been the same way. We historically have called ourselves American Indian. Now there's sort of a um, a push for us to be called Native. Some people kind of use Native American as a term. Uh, as more uh, departments open up across the universities that study us as peoples, they're usually called Native American studies, not American Indian studies. American Indian studies sort of in the language of higher education becoming kind of taboo. Now, in the last 20 years or so, the term indigenous has come into the lexicon of everybody. And now that we have the internet, we're on social media, we're sharing tweets, Instagram posts. Now indigenous has become that term to connect everybody. However, I will take you back to early 2000s when I was a student at MIT and in many ways, indigenous can be a term that is both clarifying and connecting people across the world and their suffering vis-a-vis -vis or related to colonialism. At the same time, it can be very uh, ambigu. Uh, it could be. It can create ambiguity and confusion. Um, so uh, we were on a call. Sage and I were on a call with somebody. I think it might have been Elizabeth, and there were some other people on there. But in the middle of our collective conversation, it came up. We need to be careful how we use the term indigenous in our conversations in our work here in Cambridge because we can't have people thinking that the, the political and kind of economic and colonial situation of indigenous people in South America directly kind of parallel resonate with the conditions of life here in Cambridge and Boston because they're very, very, in many ways different. So we try to be very precise with our language. And I think the use of American Indian and arguably Native, Native American um, are the most precise terms to describe the indigenous people of, of this area. Thanks, David. I mean, I think the only thing that I would add, um, so when someone calls themselves or someone is represented as an American Indian, it generally means that they're part, they're a citizen of a federally recognized tribe. So there are federally recognized tribes, there are state recognized tribes, there are nonprofits that are kind of tribe adjacent. Um, and there are, you know, just groups of folks that have 
a significant tie to the land that have created a what's called a, a band. There are certain types of bands. Um, the Natick tribe has a couple of those as well. Um, kind of just distinct to distinguish and specifically for this area where first contact happened in the 1600s or prior versus many of the plains areas or um, you know, up in even into central Canada where those um, those came much later. So uh, on a personal level, um, using indigenous, because some of my uh, ancestral lines go into what's now known as Quebec and Canada, um, into the Mi'kmaq areas, that also acknowledges that America has and had uh, fluid boundaries. So yeah. if, if you have any question, you can just ask them. Yeah, and, and, and that's part, to your point, the point that Sage is making in this moment is, is really important. The fluidity of boundaries in colonial, with despite colonial conditions is really important. White, white picket fences were not part of Native America before colonialism. Suddenly Europeans came over to America, suddenly, you know, and white picket fences went up and there's books about this. Um, and I tell people all the time, the pleasant, the pleasantries of, of kind of the aesthetics of Hollywood, where they show you the white picket fence, like Leave it the Beaver and all those other shows, they juxtapose what is obvious, the disappearance of Native people. You never see us on that, on Leave it the Beaver or Andy Griffith back in the day, or and you only see us in cowboy kind of spaghetti Westerns. Um, and I think that's really, really important because if you're asking us, you know, what are you called? It gets to a, a much more in-depth conversation, which Sage brilliantly is having right now about how our families live here and what is now Canada. Our families live here and what is whatever the state is. North, I'm from North Carolina. Um, and I explain to people all the time, there's arguments that Lakota people and Lumbee people are related. It's a deeper conversation, but it's because basically Lakota people will tell you, we used to hunt down in Western North Carolina, but you can't say that because the popular stories and narratives of American life are that Lakota people are in the Dakotas, right? And Dakota people are like, okay, I mean, we accept that in colonial kind of conditions that we're here, but when we are our deep seated thousands of year old memory shows us and, and reminds us that that we had diasporas or movements and relationships to people in what is now the Lumbee community or the Cherokee community or, or whatever the native tribal community is in North Carolina. So these, again, these are very sophisticated, nuanced conversations. And to Sage's point, it begs us to ask questions of each other and have much more in-depth relationships than we have now. And I just want... I I love that. And it it really, and you can feel free to cap it off after me too, because it's a great conversation as always. But, you know, even as New Englanders now, we travel, we acknowledge that seasons change. We had used those. And one of the problems with, well, one of the, one of the conditions, I should say, to federal recognition of a tribe is that those people have stayed in one place for a significant number of years. And when you are living in a place that is cold eight months out of the year, you travel. When there are people that are colonizing your space, you travel. When there are laws put into place that say you cannot marry the person that you love, my family that moved from Medfields and Natick because of those laws down to Rhode Island, that is part of the Nipmuc history there. And why they're not able to be federally recognized is because the force, well, that was a different type of removal different than the trail of, you know, th this happened on an individual basis with people, especially in places like New England with these small states where everybody had different laws. And so there was movement, just like we all do. But unfortunately, 
three, four hundred years and current, you know, into current times, that disallows folks from claiming their spaces. I love all this. I want to segue us to um, Sage has some historical images, and while she's get while she's teeing that up, I want to do a little show and tell with the Cambridge Historical Society's collection. I found this in storage. Can everyone see it? It's um, it's it's a long piece of stone, and it's rounded. And because when Sage and I met early on, she was she asked me like, "Do you have anything in your collection that's?" you know, that's native. And I was like, I don't, I don't think so. And she was like, well, why not? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a good question. Um, and uh, because of course, native history is history. Um, but then I found this in storage and I'm going to read off the label. It says stone fish line sinker dung up on the west side of Fresh Pond presented to the Cambridge Historical Society by Edwin C. Brooks, July 22, 1913. And um and Edwin Brooks was the superintendent of the water department or, or the like. And um, I sent a picture to Sage and she was like, I've never seen a sinker like that before. Um, so it, it, it's an interesting because, I mean, Sage is going to show us some historical images, but this was given in 1913. I'll just say that. The historical Society was founded in 1905. 1913, we were given this. And Sage, I'd love to see the, the images that you have and just to place us historically, what Cambridge folks were thinking about native people around that time. Awesome, absolutely. All right. So I've been doing a little bit of research into some of the old Cambridge articles that talked about Indians, indigenous folks, um, really everybody and, you know, kind of just to get a better understanding of when Marika said that they didn't have any his, any artifacts or articles or things written, I'm like, okay, so what was written? What was there? Um, so here's uh, a nice little cartoon poem uh, from 1920. So the Indian, and, and it relates to what we just talked about, the Indian who once got a tent and moved around and paid no rent, now looks for houses advertised and longs to be uncivilized. So this is what you know our grandparents were were learning about indigenous folks. Let's see if I can get to the next one. Uh, Mayor Quinn, back in the twenties. Sorry for the poor pixelation. Um, they're saying in this caption that he's posing as Sitting Bull, but there were, uh, he met with different tribes from the, uh, sorry, different chiefs from the Blackfoot tribe um, at City Hall. And there were um, speeches made in the Blackfoot language. Uh, as you can see, Mayor Quinn was presented with what looks like a Pendleton blanket and a uh, headdress. I wonder if those are, you know, still around somewhere. Is that Mayor Quinn of Boston or of Cambridge? Of Cambridge, Mayor Eddie Quinn. And I'm sorry, what year again was this? It's about 1920. Okay. Let's see if I can, there you go. Uh, this was an advertisement for ivory soap that has, you can see a native in the background and the idea that the cake of ivory soap to show what civilized my squaw in me and made us clean and fair to see of 1888. One of my students back in the day actually did a, a report on the racial politics of soap. So that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there were also um, some of the children's programming that you can see that was kind of similar to what we had we had learned as kids. So there were 
um, different reels. I'm not sure where the Cambridge Museum for Children was. We'll have to ask uh, around that, but there'll be different reels about Indian powwows and uh, at Banff. And Banff is up in Canada. So it does track with some of the uh, comments that we got that when people were coming to erect teepees that it didn't seem really like we're, we're not living in teepees out here, it's cold. Um, another kind of uh, cartoon here, just about moving folks from their reservations into becoming city Indians. So I'll become civilized, hang up everything else, and uh, including his eagle feathers. So, so there was an acknowledgement of of some of the sacred articles being hung up for you know, the hat. This is something I was kind of found interesting too. Nineteen thirty six, a Girl Scout troop that um, visited what they described as the lands once belonged to the Indian princess Widamo. So there was, you know, an acknowledgement also here of these trips being taken by groups of students and where and who the land belonged to prior to that. Um, it's been a, maybe 25 years since I've been a Girl Scout, but I don't recall that being a huge part of it. Um, so that also shows, you know, it kind of a juxtaposition of, you know, some of the farces, but then also some of the things that was there and we may have lost. Uh, it was pretty common uh, for non-Native folks to depict Indigenous people in uh, plays. And I found quite a few founding of Cambridge plays with that began or were including with Squaw Sachem. And for those who uh, may not know, uh, our Sachem Squaw, Squaw Sachem of Mystic uh, was the quote owner or of these lands beforehand and uh, Cambridge was purchased for 21 coats, 19 fathom of wampum, and three bushels of corn. I did check if we have the receipts, and we do. <laughs> uh, entertainment, same thing done. Uh, there were, I mean, when's the last time that we saw somebody from the Chippewa tribe give a presentation with dances, customs, speaking in their languages at Brattle Hall. It may be since 1912. Oops, sorry. Uh, this was a little bit more context about the uh, Mayor Eddie Quinn. Apologies for the very poor formatting. Same thing as well uh, with the culture classes. So um, the culture classes of 1908 were teaching folks that the Indian squaws and in, was sufficiently terrifying. So that was the culture being, you know, kind of depicted to children. And what year again was this? That was 1908. So this is again some of the um, same work that was done for uh, for the Blackfoot Indians from Glacier National Park during their trip here. And I think that's that's what I have, yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
Thanks, Sage. That was really, I mean, fascinating. There's so I, I just want to acknowledge that we're talking about a lot of stuff tonight, just touching on lots of little topics. And I realize it's an hour has flown by um, as we are just just scratching the surface of um some of these topics. So I'm wondering if if anybody has any pressing questions, um, you know, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. I'm happy to answer them. I I I would like before we leave to hear from the audience um and 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 feel free to put your notes in the chat. I'm curious how how you want to learn more about this history what would be a good way for you to learn? Do you like people talking to you? Do you like reading articles? Do you wanna see the signage? Do you wanna see an exhibition? Do you wanna have a guided tour of space? Do you wanna have a meet and greet with folks where you can ask just lo loads of questions? I'm I'm really curious how people want to learn because you know we want we wanna get you the information you want. Um, so feel free to put that in the chat um, at any time and I, I'm, I don't want to speak for them, but I will. I'm sure David and Sage are more than happy to answer your questions about anything offline as well. Um, so we can always connect connect you with people um, if you want to get an answer to something. Um, does anybody have a pressing question? That, am I seeing any raised hands? And did I miss anything in the chat that is pressing? No. Okay, well, cool. Um, um, David. Yeah, I just want to respond to, uh, is it N Nadaja Bowling? Um, Nadaja identifies as Wampanoag, Wampanoag, Wampanoag. I want to appreciate uh, Nadaja's questions about uh, identity and 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 name. Uh, I think it began with, yeah. Yeah, so um, to, to Nadaja's point, Native people across the country are perpetually stuck between the specificity and the precision of seeing us as tribal nations and also a, an emerging continually colonial nation state that doesn't identify a general category of native people. Um, and that is the political quagmire that we're in. When CNN uh, in 2020 did a report and said, hey, uh, native people, they, they listed Asian people, Latino people on their polls. And then there was a category called something else. And Native people were furious. They're like, something else, right? At least you could have said, and the category might have been Native American or American Indian. So there's a need pressing in the current colonial nation state situation for us to be identified as, as a category of people that are not Latino, that are not Asian, that are not white or black. At the same time, locally especially, but I think nationwide, there's a need for everybody from the Supreme Court to the President of the United States to the governor, to people locally, like you, school teachers or whatever, to name us as tribal nations, all 600 plus of us, right? There's 600, more than 600 tribal nations. I think maybe 637 is the count now um, that would like for uh, our, our communities, our tribal nations and our sovereignty, if you will, to be identified and always acknowledged, especially within the context of tribal nations asking for land back and asking to show up uh, in very precise ways uh, to counter a history that is pervasively and purposely um, made us invisible. So I just want to put that out there. I appreciate your question because I think this is a very rich conversation that needs to happen. I'd like to respond if I can. Um, thank you for that explanation. I uh, definitely recognize there are over 600 tribes in on Turtle Island itself, but we're talking about a signage and language program in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, there are two federally recognized tribes. There are several other historical tribes and some other groups. And so I think when we're talking about Massachusetts, which is such a small state, and there are only a handful of any sort of tribal community, it is really important that we name them. And especially for the tribes that have endured since contact, um, uninterrupted by outside government, we've been self-governing forever to not be named in these conversations is a, a big missed opportunity. Um, I said in the chat, and I think my sister did too, we're language keepers. Um, we speak and our language has not been, our program has not been consulted on this project, which is why I came to learn more and to see if there is um, a way that we would be brought into the fold. We were both born and raised in Cambridge. Um, I'm not sure what other local indigenous language programs exist, but we've been under the learning of 
a world renowned, globally renowned linguist, um, Jessie Little Doe Baird. And um, this has not been brought to her attention either. So I appreciate your added context. I have my own lived experience as um, a Massachusetts resident, someone who grew up in Massachusetts and someone whose tribe is also from Massachusetts. So thank you. Thanks and, for coming and sharing that. Yeah, that's powerful. If I can respond, um, that is what we want. We want uh, the emergence of a conversation uh, that is led, that is directed, that is um, kind of focused around uh, indigenous folks, Native American, American Indian folks here in Massachusetts, especially that have been asking, have been requesting, have been, you know, saying we want to be at the center of all educational policies here. So, yeah, I praise you for for your words. Those are gorgeous, beautiful, gorgeous, excellent words. Um, I put my email in the chat. Anyone is welcome to get in touch with me at any time. And um, we're welcoming all voices to the project. Um, like I said, we're way at the beginning and looking forward to seeing where this goes. Um, I, I'm afraid we're out of time for this one of many discussions and um, conversations that we hope to have. So I do want to thank Sage and David for their time tonight and uh, the Cambridge Community Foundation for funding this project. Uh, like I said, we're entering into phase two and um, we need more money for that uh, so that we can keep doing this excellent work. So um, if you like events like this, if you found this helpful and interesting, please support our work so we can continue to do more. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us, for being open, um, for being open to learning and asking questions. That's the way we all learn. Um, and just as we all make history, we need everyone to help fill in the historical record. So I appreciate y'all showing up. So there's going to be a survey in your inbox. Thank you for filling that out. And um, keep thinking, keep being curious, share your questions with me. Um, and we're going to do this again. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.